Radio Metropolis. Welcome to the Suspense Radio Podcast here on Radio Retropolis. When the captain of the tugboat Alphabet requires all crew to perform their tasks in alphabetical order, things get even stranger when the crewmen start to disappear in alphabetical order, fearing their mad captain is responsible. This is Murder Aboard the Alphabet from August 21st, 1947, here on the Suspense Radio Podcast on Radio Retropolis. And now, Shenley brings you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills, Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. Tonight, Roma Wines of Fresno, California, bring you Mr. John Lund in Murder Aboard the Alphabet. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. It is well past midnight now. And I write these words so that other men may know the full story of that ill-fated voyage of the deep-sea tug, Alphabet. Ours was not a large vessel, but sturdily built for its task. And though it seems an age... It was only a little over six months ago that we sailed from Liverpool, England, bound out across the North Atlantic to deliver our ship to her new owners, a salvage firm of Boston, Massachusetts. Stand by to cast off. We put out with a reduced complement, just a handful of men, 12 in all. We were a new crew sent on board for this journey over the deep sea lanes. And I sailed as chief officer under the command of Captain Godfrey Walker. Second mate Harvey Goodrum and chief engineer Alec McTavish being the other members of our small saloon. I remember we departed on a cold, wet day with the fog lying low over Birkenhead and the northwest wind blowing fresh in our teeth. Out of port! As the drab gray of the Liverpool dockside dropped back into the soaking mists, I doubt if any man aboard could have foretold what lay ahead over those 3,000 miles of heaving sea. When we had cleared the lightship, I went into the wheelhouse, where Captain Walker searched the channel ahead, his deep black eyes staring out from under his shaggy eyebrows. I saw him, his huge frame bundled in a salt-stained greatcoat. Ah, Mr. Marshland, everything secured, perceived? Yes, sir. Everything on deck is lashed down as tight as a whistle. Good, good. We may get a dirty crossing this time of the year. Oh, she'll be uncomfortable, sir. When it comes to ships, I'm used to something a little bigger. <laughs> You're on no 10,000 ton an hour, mister. If we hit it heavy, there'll be many a man on board who wish he'd never left the dockside. Oh, I think the crew can take it, sir. Well, uh, maybe, mister, maybe. A few days out and we'll see. Keep it to a course, quartermaster. All right, sir. All right, Mr. Marshall, you can take her now. Very good, sir. Your course is South 70 West. South 70 West, sir. See these helmsmen keep her on the course. I'll be back in the cabin if you want. Aye, aye, sir. Queer cow, the skipper, sir. Is he? Aye. Fear gives me the creeps, he does. Oh, he's probably harmless enough. 
Used to bigger commands than this, I imagine. Ah, but I'd keep a watch on him, sir, if I was you. Keep a watch on him? Why? Why? If you don't know now, sir, you'll find out soon enough. South 70 West. Check your course. South 70 West it is, sir. Excellent, sir. You sent for me? Oh, yes. Come in, mister. Come in. Ah. Take a chair, mister. Thank you, sir. No, not that one. Over there. Oh, certainly, sir. Is, uh, is there anything wrong? No, 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 no. Nothing's wrong. I just want to talk to you, discuss the affairs of the ship with you, give you some idea of what I expect. Oh, here. Cigarette? Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, you will not use that ashtray on your right. No, you will not use it. You may place your ash carefully on the other one. Uh, this one? Yes, yes, that one. Tell me, how long since you had your last birth, mister? Why, uh, it's been some time, sir. Oh, port captain says you know me. Well, uh, only by reputation, sir. <laughs> Would it surprise you to learn that I know something of you by reputation, mister? Why, I, I don't exactly... <laughs> we ought to make quite a pair, mister, quite a pair. No world, no matter. Now, I shall tell you the reason I summoned you to my cabin, Mr. Marshall. You will find, if you do not know already, that I have very definite ways I wish things to be done. Very definite ways. First of all, I demand complete, unquestioning obedience. Well, of course, sir. I'm sure you'll get the fullest cooperation from myself and the crew. Uh, good, good. I want that to be perfectly clear. I also insist that your supervision of the work on the ship be done in a certain manner I shall prescribe. All items of work will be carried out in alphabetical order. Alphabetical order, sir? Precisely. Starting with A and carrying through to Z. Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. I think my meaning is perfectly clear. Uh, if the hands are painting ship, they will start with the alleyways and all other items beginning with A. Then the bulkheads, then the decks, and so forth. You understand me now, mister? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. I, I, I think I understand. But uh, I'm afraid I don't quite see your reason. Mr. Marshall! My reasons are not to be questioned. You will remember, while I'm in command of this vessel, I hold the power of life and death. <laughs> Well, sir. He was sitting across from me on the small settee of his cabin, his massive face half hidden in the shadows, his eyes piercing into mine. In the nearness of him, I could see the bloodshot veins like thin red tracings against the white. The man was mad. Higgins was right. He was mad. Yes, life and death. I looked about his cabin. There was something inhuman in its ordered neatness, as if the warmth of man had not touched it. I saw the books stacked evenly in the bookshelf. I saw the titles arranged in alphabetical order. It was a pattern complete in itself. The desk, the bunk, immaculate. Not a wrinkle or speck of dust visible to the naked eye. On the bulkhead were four photographs, enlargements of outdoor scenes. With a start, I realized they, too, were in perfect order, arranged according to the seasons, from left to right, spring, summer, autumn, winter. My eyes darted about me again, and on the shelf above his bunk, I saw three cameras. They also fitted the pattern, the smallest on the left, the largest on the right. I remembered the chair and the ashtray, and turned towards him as he spoke again. Uh, is that uh, perfectly clear, Mr. Marshall? Yes, sir. Perfectly clear. Good, good. Now, one final thing. I insist that the quartermasters taking the wheel appear in sequence of the first letter of their surnames. But, sir, that will mean rearranging the watches, surely. Silence! Because... You will do as I order. Very good, sir. The watches will be changed. <laughs> That's better, much better. Well, mister, now that we understand one another, we shall cease talking about the ship. Aha! <laughs> 
I see you've noticed my photographs. Well, I can't say I know much about it, sir, but I'd say they're excellent. Of course they're excellent. I took them myself, a hobby of mine. You uh, may have noticed I have three cameras. Two of them are of German make, the other American. The medium-sized one in the middle I use with infrared film. Comparatively recent development. The other two I use for general purposes. Are you interested in photography, Mr. Marshall? Well, I can't say I am particularly, sir. I've never done anything like that for a hobby. Very well, if you're not interested, you may go. Oh, I didn't mean that I was... That is an order, Mr. Marshall. You will now go. I left him then and stumbled into the cold darkness outside, the thoughts tumbling unendingly through my head as I made my way to my cabin. We were pushing our way over the restless waters of the North Atlantic with a madman in command. On the morning of the third day, the second officer came running onto the bridge and flung himself excitedly into the wheelhouse. Mr. Marshall, I'd like a word with you. Well, go ahead, Goodrum. What is it? Will you, will you come outside? I... I can't tell you here. Certainly. Now, what in the world is the matter with you? It's, it's the wireless operator, sir. Abercrombie. He's gone. You mean he's disappeared? Off the ship? Disappeared? <laughs> Maybe. But I wouldn't wonder if there was a better name for it than that, sir. What do you mean? I mean murder. Abercrombie was gone, vanished without a trace from the decks of the alphabet. And although I didn't have the feeling myself, there was an uneasiness within the crew now. They seemed furtive, frightened, and they quietly drifted out of sight whenever the captain made an appearance on the deck. You could see they feared him, and somehow connected his madness with the disappearance of the wireless operator. That night, I stood in the darkness of the wheelhouse faint light from the binnacle shining on the face of Higgins as he stood his trick at the wheel. It's a rum go, sir. That Abercrombie didn't just fall over the side by himself. Mark my words on that. Oh, come now, Higgins. Many a man has disappeared from shipboard, swept over the side by a sea. Ah, uh, sir, on a stormy night, that may be. But last night was a pretty quiet one. Just a little kiss of rain. Done in he was, sir. But why? What reason? Reason? No one had no reason, sir. Except maybe the queer one. The queer one? Aye, the skipper, sir. Good heavens, man. Are you accusing the captain of... He's not a normal man, sir. I wouldn't be too loud about the captain, Higgins. You can't accuse people without evidence. Well, keep me tongue. But the skipper's off his rocker. You know that as well as I do, sir. Oh, he's got some set ideas about things, but that doesn't... Alphabetical ideas, sir? Well, yes, but... Ain't you thought of this, sir? His name, Abercrombie. What of it? Beginning with the hay, the first letter of the alphabet. Abercrombie was the first. But he won't be the last, sir. He won't be the last. Needless to say, the conclusions of the men were no surprise to me. But I didn't feel the time was ripe for further action. On the evening of the following day, the barometer started dropping. And next morning saw the low gray clouds scudding swiftly before the wind. And the alphabet laboring heavily in the rising sea. It was at eight bells of the morning watch, the sixth day at sea. Who's there? It's McTavish, Mr. Mead. Oh, come in, Chief. Yeah. Take a chair, Chief. Well, what is it? You look bothered. Butterfield, mister. He's lost. Lost? Aye. Are you sure, McTavish? Oh, I am sure enough. We've searched for him all around the ship. 
There's nae a trace, mister. Have you informed the captain? Ah, the old man. Didn't you think he knows it? Come on. There's another man gone, sir. Butterfield. Butterfield, eh? Aye, sir. How long have you known this, Mr. Marshall? The chief engineer informed me only a few moments ago, sir. Are you sure of this, Mr. McTavish? Aye, I'm sure. There's nae a trace of him anywhere aboard the ship. Very well, Mr. McTavish, you may go. I wish to speak to the chief officer alone. What about Butterfield, sir? Go, Mr. McTavish! That's an order! Aye, sir. I'll be off. Well, Mr. Marshall, I'm afraid this is beyond me, sir. No, I'm not referring to the engineer, mister. He's obviously disappeared. There's nothing we can do about it. Well, why are you standing? Why don't you sit down? Well, I'd... Uh, but thank you, sir. Yes, it's Thursday. You may sit in the armchair. Thank you. Uh, well, what do you think of my ship now? Do you still find it uncomfortable? Oh, no, sir. I, I like it very well. I thought a long time before I shipped aboard. Oh, you did, eh, mister, huh? Well, she's small, but then any ship's a ship, eh? I'd like something a little more, but then... Then the sea is the lady that counts. Am I right? That's right, sir. You love her. You love her very much, don't you, Marshal? I do. Yes, I do. You're young, but you love her more than anything? More than anything. More than is, uh... More than is natural. Captain. Uh, and now you're seated. Uh, would you like to inspect my cameras and tell me what you think of them? Well, I'm afraid I don't know a great deal about that sort of thing, sir. Oh, you know nothing about them. Very hey, good, you may leave my cabin. Certainly, sir. I shall look into the Butterfield matter. He's left the ship, mister. You're only wasting your time. Now go. <laughs> The second time I left the cabin of that strange man, I left him alone with his madness, and steadying myself against the roll of the ship, walked the deck, thinking my own thoughts. It was that night that Higgins came to me in my cabin. I bade him enter, and he settled his wizened body down upon my armchair. I was lying in my bunk, watching him as he sat there, awkwardly twisting his cap in his hands. It's an unusual request I have, sir, and I, I, I hope I can speak in confidence, like. Go on, Higgins. Whatever you have to say will be just between the two of us. Well, sir, we think the skipper should be put away, sir. Put away? What do you mean? Locked up, sir, but he can't harm us. You know, that's mutiny. Oh, it's mutiny, but, but Mr. Marshland, he'll murder us all. Abercrombie, Butterfield... He'll go clear on down the alphabet if we don't stop him. There's no proof. Well, the lads are sure enough. Are they? Just give us the word, sir, and we'll help you. We'll put him away. Very well, Higgins. Keep it among yourselves, but you can tell the men this. If there's any more trouble, I'll take matters into my own hands. You can rest assured of it. Blimey. Thank you, sir. It may be mutiny... But there ain't a court in the world as ever would convict you, ain't it? No. No, Higgins, I don't think there is. It had to be done very carefully. And for quite a while, I lay back upon my bunk, thinking of what Higgins had said. It would be risky, but the men were behind me. That would more than sway the balance. Higgins was right. Any court of law would see the wisdom of my action. They would never convict for mutiny. And Captain Walker would be locked away forever. We continued on our way. And in the howl of the wind and the long seas, you could sense the cold hand of fear that had settled over the alphabet. By the evening of the seventh day, we stood well out on our great circle track. More than halfway between Liverpool and Boston. We plunged through dirty seas, rising to each crest and falling to the trough below, with the water curling green over the flare of our bluff bows. 
But we made fair time, and the knot slipped steadily astern. It was during the inky blackness of that night that death struck again on the decks of the alphabet, and another member of our dwindling band disappeared into the unknown. Abercrombie, Butterfield, and now the third man. His name was Chadwick. Who's that? Oh, good evening, sir. Dirty weather, sir. Well, I'll be getting below, sir. Would you please let me by? I I want to go below. I... Oh, no! 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 Oh, oh, are you a clumsy fool? Ah. You dropped something, sir. Never mind, I'll get it. There. Up rather late, aren't you, Mr. Marshallin? You are too, aren't you, Captain? I thought I heard a scream. Oh, did you now, mister? Did you? Wait, we're all here, sir. You all know why you're here. Yes, sir. The lads know. We're with you, mister. Uh, We'll stop his tricks, we will. Good. Now, we must do this quietly and quickly. There must be no bungling, understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Here goes. Yes? Captain Walker, will you come on deck a minute? Well, mister, what is it you want? Come out here, sir. I want to show you something. Take your hand with you, Mr. Marshall. Never mind that, man. Captain, stay where you are. This gun is loaded. So now it's mutiny. Marshalin, you'd better Shut think. up. One move and I'll shoot. Ah, and you'll get my knife in your gizzard. Mr. Marshalin, he's a skipper now. You swing for this, Marshalin. You and all the rest. <laughs> you really think they'll hang a mate for mutiny when they can hang a captain for murder? sailed into Boston Harbor with Captain Walker lashed securely to a chair in his cabin. After the first brief struggle, he had grown quieter, and during the last days of our voyage, he had just sat there, silently, saying nothing, a strange, mad smile leering from his lips. We arrived in Boston late in the afternoon, and as we sailed up the harbor, we hoisted the international signal calling for the harbor police. After we had docked alongside, I I went up to his cabin to ensure that all was in readiness for the arrival of the police. And as I stood over him, bound there in his chair, his eyes seemed to mock me, his smile taunting me. (laughs) So, Mr. Marshland, this is to be the success of your little plan, eh? I have nothing to say to you, Captain. The police will be aboard at any moment. You think I'm mad, don't you? Well, maybe I am. But you've bungled it badly, mister. You've bungled it very badly. Have I? Who's that? Police. Police, come in, come in. Officer, this man is... Yes, you've bungled it, Mr. Marshall. Why weren't you content to let me be with my madness? As I was content to let you be with yours. Oh, we'd have made quite a pair, as I told you, if you hadn't bungled it. What are you talking about? Oh, oh. I know all about you, mister. Under a bit of a cloud, eh? Haven't shipped for quite a while. Not the first vessel you've been on where men have disappeared in the black of the night, eh? Oh, but I wouldn't have cared. No, I liked your methods, businesslike. By the letters, by the alphabet. You are mad. Take him away, officer. Yes, mad, quite. But you should have taken more interest in my photography, mister. My infrared film, for instance. You can take pictures on the darkest night. Would I have one, mister? An excellent likeness. A likeness? Of you, mister. The night you pushed Chadwick over the side. (laughs) 
The police have been very understanding. They could readily understand how a man could hate and fear the sea and yet love it like a woman. Love it enough to follow it and hunger for it and make every sacrifice. Even human sacrifice. But now they say they must send me away to a place where the sea can no longer torture me. A place of no land or sea or wind or rain, but only rest. It is time, my son. Can you pray? Yes. To the sea. Only to the sea. Suspense. Murder Aboard the Alphabet, starring John Lund. Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Those better tasting Roma Wines. America's favorite wines. John Lund will soon be seen in Paramount's 36-star production, Variety Girl. Tonight's suspense play was by Charles Turrell. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Lloyd Nolan as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Don't forget, next week, Suspense will present Lloyd Nolan. The following week, Edmund O'Brien. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And that was Murder Aboard the Alphabet from August 21st, 1947, here on the Suspense Radio Podcast on Radio Metropolis. Did anybody figure out what the twist could have been? You might have. I didn't. When you listen to a show like Suspense, the first thing you do first thing I do, is try and guess what the switch is going to be. In all great suspenseful tales, things are not always as they appear, of course. Sometimes the twist is that there is no twist, in which the person you assumed from the beginning was the guilty party, and in spite of the story trying to take you down a few red herring hallways, turns out to be the guilty party. Your first instinct was correct. Sometimes the story clearly points to the guilty party, and then we are shown in the last few minutes that we were dead wrong. That happens more often than not. In this story, we are given very strong evidence of a good man trying to do the right thing with an apparently delusional captain. The story is told by Marshall, this man Marshall, who feels he needs to do what has to be done to save the ship and crew from certain doom at the hands of this murderous captain. The story never sways from this direction, which means, really, that it can only play out one way. Marshall is the crazy one. The first clue is that he is the narrator of his experience, after the fact. Many months later, having survived whatever we were to learn what was to happen. The second clue is that all revelations of plot are told through Marshall. So whatever happened was skewed by Marshall's perception, which we now know as Marshall's attempt to erase or alter the horrific deeds he has done. It's to place it in a different direction. 
It's a great story, and it gets a solid B from me as a suspense episode. As I just mentioned here and spoke about this in recent podcasts, and what, we're about 232 podcasts in with suspense since we began this series, we expect a certain style of story. Now, you know, I keep saying we in here, and I shouldn't say we, it's me. I expect a certain style of story. I think I keep saying we is because I feel that by now we're simpatico with what we are listening to and we're of one mind, but I shouldn't assume that because you may have different takes on a lot of these shows than what I have. And that's okay too. That's what this is all about. You got to have your own experience and your own opinions about these shows. My opinion is just mine. And sometimes it can be a good guidepost if for people that want to learn a little bit more about it. But your opinions are still your own and they are valid. So I have to stop saying the we. And when I'm talking about my commentary here, and I just got to stick with the I. But I expect a certain style of story. And now I can figure out the twists a lot easier. At least I can come up with two logical scenarios of which one would be correct about 90% of the time. That's okay. That's all right. We last heard John Lund, the actor here, almost a year prior to this episode, uh, in, I think this, the episode was called The Plain Case of Murder, Plain, P-L-A-N-E, Case of Murder, from October 10th, 1946, about a soldier returning from overseas and learning his girlfriend is marrying a very rich man, not him. He decides to trick her into letting him help her murder him, all the while planning to frame her for the crime as his revenge. Why, did, why would she want to murder this very rich man? Because turns out that the John Lund character here in the, in the plain case for murder uh, positioned himself as a much richer man who's going to have even greater success. And of course, she was a gold digger, and that's why she went along with this ruse. So in knowing this, you can understand why Lund was cast in this story. It's basically the same deception, except in this case, he was truly mad and he didn't realize he was the one doing this. John Lund got his start in 1941 on Broadway in As You Like It and was considered one of the most promising new actors of the year. It was 1945's The Hasty Heart, which really gave him much critical acclaim. Before signing off tonight, uh, Joe Kearns was promoting Lund's newest picture, Variety Girl, which was to be released three days after this broadcast on August 23rd, 1947. But this was really just a glorified cameo, considering it featured a who's who of Hollywood legends appearing in it. Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Gary Cooper, Barbara Stanwyck, and at least 55 other actors of that stature. So Lund... A capable actor, yet hardly an A-list star, barely made a blip in that film. The film's most memorable scene was a number with Crosby and Hope called Harmony. You may remember that, where they each dressed in matching suits, checkered suits, I believe, and straw hats. And that was the big hit. It was the year prior, though, 1946, where he did stand out in a performance uh, in the film To Each His Own with Olivia de Havilland. Other films of note were A Foreign Affair from 1948 with Gene Arthur and Marlena Dietrich, uh, Miss Tatlock's Millions, uh, also 1948, A Man of Her Own, 1950 with Barbara Stanwyck, The Mating Season, 1951 with Jean Tierney. But after 51, his star, like many, began to fade. Uh, when I say many, it's many of his kind, uh, the, the B actor, uh, that did many B-movies of the 40s. Those actors found it very difficult to continue working into the 50s, and of course, what, it, what came in the 50s, television. So that's where they began to move. He's best known to radio fans of the golden era as the lead in yours truly, Johnny Dollar, from 1952 to 54. He did High Society with Grace Kelly in 1956, and that was it as he never appeared in another film, although he did become vice president of the Screen Actors Guild from 1950 to 59. He quit the business completely in 1963 and spent his remaining years in his home. Yep, just wanted to be left alone. Perhaps he soured on the business because he believed he was not that special in his own words. 
for that era. He knew his peak. He knew what his limitations were. Whenever I think of this John Lund quote, and there's been others of his era that had kind of the same quotes, these sort of B movie actors that you can just put in slots in films and they would be very capable in doing so, very good at what they do, but not really memorable in those roles. Well, I think about Clint Eastwood in the Dirty Harry films because in every film, he, you know, Clint Eastwood had, you know, a catchphrase, a quote, right? The first film, Dirty Harry, was... Uh, Do you feel lucky, punk? And then in Sudden Impact, which was the fourth film in 1983, it was Go Ahead, Make My Day, which was probably the biggest catchphrase of all the Dirty Harry films. But he did have one in the second film, Magnum Force, which applies here to John Lund. And it said, a man's got to know his limitations. And he said that several times in the film. And what did uh, Harry Callahan mean by that? And he says, he meant you have to know where the level of your greatness ends. Well, that's it here with John Lund. He, had, he knew his limitations. And he was quoted as saying, I look best from a great distance and in a bad light. I have a peculiar face, an odd walk, and about as much sex appeal as a goat. Unquote. Yeah. John Lund died of a heart condition on May, uh, May 10th, rather, 1992, at the age of 81. So he lived a good long life. Also in our cast tonight, Jerry Hausner, Ben Wright, and William Johnstone. Original script by Charles Terrell and directed by William Spear, Joe Kearns was our announcer. And that'll do it for us tonight. That was Murder Aboard the Alphabet from August 21st, 1947, here on the Suspense Radio Podcast on Radio Tropics. (laughs) 